The late 1950s in America, the good life. It sounds like a place that exists only as a memory. For how good could life have been, really? In that period of time, I crammed as many adventures into a life as anyone could have. During those days, the Russians were the first to launch a machine into outer space. Television invaded our home, and my brother and I would eat TV dinners as we sat in our living room, watching Bonanza and The Twilight Zone and Howdy Doody. Charles Starkweather was in upstate Nebraska, and the Dakotas on a killing spree that took ten lives. At Swaney School, where I was a first-grade student, we would practice duck and cover air raid drills in the hallways, filled with laughing children during our Halloween carnival. From my schoolroom door, I could look out onto endless fields of golden vegetation. Was it wheat or wildflowers? The killers of Truman Capote's book *In Cold Blood* did their deeds to a family in a farmhouse on the plains. I spent the first five years of my life growing up in a little town outside of Wichita, Kansas. The town was called Derby. I never saw anyone wearing a derby, nor did I meet anyone by that name. I don't know why they called it Derby. Sometimes, when I recall those days, it is as if I am there again, and no years have passed. I was raised up right at the First Baptist Church of Derby on stories about Jesus, sacrifice, death, and resurrection. And after church on Sundays, my family and I went home and had roast beef. And mashed potatoes and gravy. People waved a lot to each other in Derby. There weren't that many people in town not to know and wave to. And if you didn't know the person who was waving at you, then you probably knew someone that they did. So you might as well wave at them. I can remember walking on the back roads around Derby on bright fall afternoons with my mother. I was five years old, and I had decided to start a collection of nails. Some people collected rocks. Some collected coins. I chose nails. Must have been that crucifixion thing I learned about in Sunday school. As we walked along, I would search the gravel roadway for discarded nails. There were a lot of them. I found brads and three-penny nails, carpet tacks, and finished nails. One day, I found a particularly long, rusty nail. It was at least eight inches long and had spots of faded red paint on it. Had it been used on a big old barn somewhere in the Kansas landscape? I was so excited by my find, I ran with nail in hand to show my mother, who walked ahead of me. I slipped and fell, and the somewhat blunt yet still pointed end of the nail poked into the flesh of my palm. My mother, frightened, scooped me up and grabbed my hand to examine it. There was some blood, but mostly frightened tears. She spoke to calm me. Don't cry, honey. Remember, Jesus had nails put in his hands and feet on the cross for our sins. Hmm. Her attempt to comfort me, but the wound still hurt. And after all, wasn't Jesus a god? What's a few nails driven into your body if you're a god? Months later, I was washing my hands in the bathroom of our home. I noticed a blue plastic cup of water the sitting water on the sink. The water tasted sour and it smelled bad. I was thirsty, so I drank from it. It wasn't water at all. I knew it had to be poison. I ran screaming into the living room. It had to be my poison. My parents sat watching television. My mother asked what was wrong. I told her about the liquid from the bathroom. She thought it was poison too. My father ran to see what liquid I had drank. He came out with the cup, sniffing it, and said to my mother. Vinegar. She relaxed, but still had to comfort me in my hysteria. There, there! Don't you know Jesus was given vinegar on a sponge as he hung upon the cross for us? First the nails months before, and now the vinegar, and each time the reference to Jesus and his horrible death. As they put me to bed that night, I was nervous. I said my prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I knew the rest of the story. I had a vision of my parents burying me in a hole in the backyard, expecting me to rise up out of the earth in three days. I was worried. I didn't think I had the strength to dig through all that dirt. 
Around the same time period, my mother, who had been physically ill since I could remember, also became less sound mentally. Secretly, my father made arrangements to have her committed to the sanitarium in Wichita. One afternoon, a strange black car pulled up in front of the house. Two men got out and walked to our door and knocked. They were from the sheriff's department, and they had a court order to take her away. She calmly began to prepare her clothes for the trip, ironing and packing a few things as the sheriffs quietly waited in our living room. My father kept my older brother and I at bay in the backyard. Dad said Mom was sick again and had to go to a special hospital. The men were there to help. I watched as the black car took my mother to Wichita. A few days later, we visited her at the hospital. She wore a gown and talked to us as we sat in the sunroom. To my brother and I, it was just another time when Mom was sick, and soon she would be home. Years later, my mother told me what sort of hospital it really was, and how a woman doctor, a staff psychiatrist, had come to her room to assess her mental condition. The doctor had Rorschach inkblot cards with her. Rorschach cards are black, randomly created shapes on white cardstock, used as a sort of yardstick to determine mental stability or instability. What a patient thinks they see in the dark stains upon the card might lend insight into their condition. Now my mother had her own doctor in her corner, so to speak. He advised her to answer questions directly and simply, so to speak. Don't give them any reason to question your sanity. The interviewing doctor sat on her bed and showed her the cards one by one. What do you see when you look at this card? Remembering her own doctor's advice, she answered. I see a white card that has had black ink poured onto it, making a shape. And so it went. The doctor must have had at least 20 of these cards. And so they played their 20 questions. And each time when she was asked what she saw on the card before her, she replied, I see a white card that has had black ink poured onto it, making a shape. Such a simple answer. So zen-like. I wondered about my own perceptions after she told me these things. Maybe what I have perceived as the trials and joys of life are like the images on these cards. My life is like a white card that has had the black ink of existence poured onto it, making a shape, not good or bad. The good life. 